How much? How much? Hey, yo. One. The cold car, how much? One, we are in Zanzibar, at the most unusual market I've ever been to. These are just rocks, the kind you see all over the place, just on the ground. They sell rocks here. Roll up, roll up, rocks, cheap rocks. Look, 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 look. I collected these rocks and brought them here. This is a market for rocks that he used to make a foundation of a house or to build house walls. Rocks! Rocks! Best rocks here! <laughs> and any time anyone makes a stop here, see, the entire crowd hurries to those people and all these guys literally attack them to offer their rocks as somehow the best rocks of all. One truckload of rocks will build you a medium-sized wall or a foundation for a house. Ten thousand, twenty thousand. How much? Uh -huh. One two. How much? How much for one car? One lakh. Uh, for the whole car, car yeah. Uh, one lakh. One, one lakh. Uh, <laughs> a truckload of rocks will cost you seventy dollars. So if you want more than one wall, if you want a house with a bathroom and a roof, you need ten truckloads of rocks. So you can, in fact, build a pretty good house for seven hundred dollars. You might be surprised to find out that a while ago, the same amount of money could buy you a living, breathing human. Here in Zanzibar, they had Africa's largest slave market. And one human, just like you or me, used to cost here roughly $700. That's cheaper than an iPhone. This is a room where they used to keep the slaves. We can enter and look around. There's a very low ceiling. I cannot stand up right here. Inhuman cruelty. These are slabs of concrete. There are no beds, just a surface made of concrete where people had to lie on top of each other. They kept here 30 to 40 people at once, sometimes 70. No one bothered to count them, in fact. And whenever someone died, they simply pushed that person down on the floor here. So just a beating for them. Uh -huh. And uh, those uh, slaves are crying, okay. it means the price become under. By well, now, Zanzibar has completed its transformation from the slave trading hell into a tourist's paradise. They've got white beaches, all night markets with amazing food, prehistoric caves that are millions of years old. It's mind-blowing. And happy people who are no longer scared that one day they can be kidnapped and sold off like their grandfathers. This is Lyadov. And today we are in Africa. This is Tanzania and Zanzibar Island. We know this place today as a paradise. It has earned the nickname of the African Maldives. Just a hundred years ago though, the place was the world's main slave trading hub. From here, thousands, even millions of slaves were shipped to America and Britain. This is Lyadov reporting on how people live in Zanzibar. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. We're on our way to Zanzibar and here you can see the island. But the truth is that Zanzibar is not just an island, it's an archipelago. It consists of 75 islands. Zanzibar is an island that is part of Tanzania, a coastal country in East Africa. Look, only 30 miles separate the island from the continent. Although it's part of Tanzania, you get your passport checked and stamped on Zanzibar with a visa stamp because Zanzibar considers itself a state within a state, with its own government and police. The stamp features the symbol of the revolutionary government of Zanzibar that seized power here and declared independence in 1964. In essence, Zanzibar is today an autonomous republic that is part of Tanzania. 
make sure you have change on you because I didn't have any bills smaller than $100 and that's why I'm carrying my bags myself. An entrance visa to Zanzibar costs $50, but if you want to get it on the spot, prepare to wait for about an hour and a half in a line. It's better to apply for it online beforehand. And book your driver in advance too. Local taxi drivers are all overcharging. A fair price for a ride from the airport to the city is about $30. You can book a hotel room or find a place to stay at a local house. A room by the sea will cost about $40 per night. There are rooms for rent offered by the local restaurants on the beach. Finding a place to stay won't be a problem, but it won't be a five-star accommodation. It may lack some things, like an air conditioner or even a fridge. If you'd rather stay at a hotel, the best ones are on the northern part of the island. Nungui and Kendua resorts have those signature white sand beaches and the azure blue ocean. $70 will pay for a night at a three-star hotel here. Anything comfier is over $100. If you want something closer to the real life on the island, look for a place in the old part of the city called Stone Town. The beaches here are also amazing. In general, Zanzibar has earned the nickname of the African Maldives. The temperature in winter here is 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water gets as warm as 27 degrees Celsius. That's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what most people call summer. When I arrived on Zanzibar, I got my suitcase, got out into the city and started walking. There was a local guy who asked me, why are you walking so fast? And I was like, wait, indeed, why am I walking so fast? And he said, pole, pole. They all say it here, meaning slow down. And this slow down, chill thing is what creates this entire African vibe around here, this atmosphere. And you feel it very clearly, especially here on a beach in Zanzibar. Like everywhere in the world, both locals and tourists hit the beach in the evening when the air cools down a bit. Some guys are playing volleyball, others are fishing. The majority are simply chilling. That's how I like it too. It's so much fun chilling on a beach and watching people. There's so much to see here. For example, look at these guys in unusual robes playing soccer. And one of them, if you look closer, is wearing a real sword on his belt. There's nothing unusual for him. He's all in the game. These are not the kind of guys who pose for photos with tourists. These are real Maasai people of the local nomadic tribe. They build homes from cow dung, wear traditional robes. Yet, at the same time, they use smartphones and make shoes out of car tires. Aren't they gorgeous? A couple of girls walk by, covered from head to toe, carrying some plastic buckets on their heads. That's how people carry things here, by the way. These girls are from a different ethnic group, the Swahili people. They are part of Arabic and part of African ancestry, descendants of people from the Middle East and African tribes. Even little girls, as you can see, are wearing colorful, bright headscarves. That's because the Swahili people are Muslims. And right next to them, white European girls in bikinis are playing beach volleyball. While these local guys are busy with some stuff in plastic bags and are clearly displeased to see us shooting them on camera. After dinner, all of Zanzibar's youth comes to the seafront. That's where you can feel the real Zanzibar vibes. They've got a lot of young people here and very little crime because locals understand that since tourists are bringing money, it's best to make them happy. It's 6 p.m. and I'm in the center of Zanzibar. This part is called Old Town. And here at this part, they run this local kind of challenge for fun. All the local boys come here to take running jumps into the sea in turns. It's almost like the local boys here are having an artistic diving competition. One puts a hat on his head during the jump. The other makes a bow in the air. Others do whatever they can. The point seems to make it as fun and as wild as possible. While some are trying to think of ways to surprise the audience, others are so athletic it comes to them naturally. They are indeed like real athletes. Look at this backflip. Then a double flip in the air. Then ground jumping begins. One guy goes in, followed by another, and so on. Seeing them jump makes my heart sink a little every time because it looks like they're jumping into an abyss. It's pretty high here, about 20 feet. 
The guys make their way climbing back the slippery old wall, flirting with the visiting girls on the way, and then march through the crowds in wet clothes. The guys form groups, and they each hold a board in their hands. They write on it something, and then take it with them as they jump into the water. You can have these guys advertise your business, say birthday greetings or welcome someone. I made a donation of a few dollars and chose a welcome stunt. And here he goes, here he goes, and he jumps. Wow! Hakuna Matata is the island's motto. It means no worries, just relax and chill. It is true that today these guys have a lot less problems than their forefathers a hundred years ago. Today, tourists come here from all over the world and spend money. It's hard to believe that not so long ago, this island was Africa's own pit of hell. If you got here, it meant that you were never going to see your family and would, at best, die in some faraway country. Zanzibar was Africa's largest slave trade center. This here is an absolutely abominable place. It served an important role in the entire business of slave trading. These are the rooms where slaves were kept. Most of us think that the slave trade is something that is related to the discovery of America and the British Empire. But the truth is that the slave trade flourished here a long time before Columbus reached the new continent, from at least the 9th century AD. As the business reached its absolute peak in the 18th century, the entire east coast from Mozambique to Persia was controlled by Oman, which was then a major sea power. It was a huge territory compared to the entire coastline in Europe. The Omani Empire controlled sea routes, ports, harbors, all trade, and the trade market in Stone Town on Zanzibar. This says here, slave chamber. So it's not a museum reconstruction, it's the original, authentic slave chamber, a place where slaves were kept before being taken to the market. Sort of like a pantry or a fridge, where you keep produce before you put it on the counter. Please excuse this horrific comparison, but the ugly truth is that that's pretty much how it was. Kidnapped people were delivered to Zanzibar from the continent on sailing vessels called dows. There are still a lot of those around today, the buyers gathered at the market. Lots of slaves died right here. The ceiling is very low, you have to crouch. Do you know why many slaves died? Mostly because of hunger, because owners never gave them any food, like at all. It usually took a few days to sell all the slaves, and during that time, the owners kept their spendings as tight as possible. They didn't give them any water or food, and separated families. Women and children were kept separately from men in different rooms. Here, in these underground rooms with no windows, captives were waiting to be sold off at an auction. Let's take a look inside. This is a room where they used to keep the slaves. We can enter and look around. There's a very low ceiling. I cannot stand up right here. These are slabs of concrete. There are no beds, just a surface made of concrete where people had to lie on top of each other. They kept here 30 to 40 people at once, sometimes 70. No one bothered to count them, in fact. And whenever someone died, they simply pushed that person down on the floor here, and the bodies were lying there until they were removed. Or not. No one, in fact, bothered to clean up the dead bodies. Strong men were the most valuable commodity. Oddly enough, back then, they believed that castration made men more enduring. So they subjected poor captives to botched surgeries right here on the spot. All dead bodies were discarded into the ocean. You can imagine what these beautiful white sand beaches of five-star hotels looked like back in the day. They've got original slave shackles here. Here they are. The irons they put on slaves back then really gives me the creeps to realize it's a real thing from those times. Because, you know, this ring, for example, it had to go around someone's neck. So it had to be opened to put around a slave's neck and then closed again. They put smaller rings on people's hands too and so on. The most valuable slaves had both their hands and feet chained and their necks too to prevent them from running. When buyers arrived, slaves were taken to the market for auction. The center of the auction was this pit, where people in chains were put up for show and appraisal. 
slaves, they were just a whipping post. They were just a beating for them. Uh -huh. And uh, those uh, slaves were crying, okay. it means the price become under. Oh. And if you are not crying, it means the price become expensive. Oh. So because they see that they're just a finding for the, the hard work one. It's a heavy one. It's a powerful man. Okay. Women were cheaper than men. Those who knew any kind of craft, such as sewing or cooking, cost more. People with physical defects were often sold at half price. Young women for harems cost twice as much as young women for field labor. At an average, the price for a slave ranged from $300 to $7,000, which is roughly a month's rent. And that one for the slave master, for the leader, so that was a free, no chain. That one, you see, that one was a free, because what you're leading for these others. Overseers were usually former slaves. If the owner liked you, they could free you if they felt like it, just because it was a good day or because your life was over. And you know what these former slaves chose to do? They chose to have their own slaves because it was the easiest and fastest way to get rich. Slave trade was the oil business of those days. Only getting slaves was easier than drilling for oil. The wealthiest slave owners became top officials in their countries, ranking as present-day ministers or oligarchs or owners of major corporations. But nowadays, young Zanzibaris have different aspirations. They want to become hip-hop stars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every time CC to yeah. Apollo to Mziki yeah. And attack a nini bass Let's go! Let's go! Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Now this is Africa for you You could just be taking a stroll in the park And bump into a bunch of guys under a tree Rapping Rapping <laughs> Are you a group or your team or just friends? Like, well, what's it like? We are just friends. Okay. But we combine together to make something official. And this guy is my, my official producer. He's my fellow student. Okay. We met here. And this guy is like my best friend, you know. All right. Because he did music very well and I'm an artist. Uh -huh. I'd like to combine with him so that we can create good music. Yeah. These guys are students at a local arts college. All of them came from different provinces to start their career as musicians. If you listen carefully, you'll hear they're rapping both in English and the local language, Swahili. Yeah. Swahili is one of three official languages on Zanzibar, the other two being Arabic and English. These guys rap in English too to expand their audience. When I hear them rap, I feel connection to the very essence of rap music. It's historical core. Yeah. I hear elements of local African tribal singing, some trip hop beats, Arabic melodies, and something groovy. They are ready to take on Spotify. Then they begin a kind of improv session. One starts a theme and the others cue in, each one in their own unique style. Then it's another guy's turn. He starts up a tune and the others pick it up. What's your dream? What do you wanna who you want to become in like ten years? Me. I want to be a uh, biggest artist in Tanzania. Yes. And uh, what is rap for you? So when you rap the reality of life. Yeah, we're rapping because of the, our lives, the way we people, they are surrounded us. We rap according we see the situations. Yeah, uh -huh. even feelings, we rap according to feelings. Yeah. Yes. What do you feel inside and time of doing this? Yeah. I feel happy and when you rap, and I feel like uh, good vibes uh -huh. and 
hustling okay. on yeah. streets. Oh, no. oh, it's yeah. strange. These people feel yes. strange. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we are doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal and we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. Africa is not only the place where slave trade started off, it's the place where rhythm was born. African drums and all this singing and dancing like right now, it literally gives me goosebumps. It makes me feel so energized. It's incredible. When they're playing drums, they are playing from their heart. It comes from their soul. Look at this incredible woman and this incredible guy. Look at how they dance with full abandon, even though the audience can be counted on the fingers of one hand. <laughs> People gather in parks on the weekend here for musical performances. They play drums, sing songs, and dance. It looks incredible. And at times a bit weird. Look, for example, this girl has a leather whistle in her mouth and some sort of a hoe in her hands? But there's a lot more to this dance than simply waving this hoe over her head. The dance is a story they are telling. It could be a story of planting seeds. It could be a story about how they went fishing. It could be a dance or a song or both. <laughs> This particular dance seems to be about working in the field or at a quarry. Just look at this amazing guy. Look at him. He's on fire. Just look at him. Look at him. Look how much joy it gives him to become one with the dance, become this world of rhythms, steps, and movements of arms, legs, and body. It's something else. There's so much energy in it. And that's what I feel makes Africa stand out against all other continents. People here are more generous sharing their energy than in any other place I've been to. Drum music and dancing have a very special meaning for African tribes. They are not merely a form of entertainment, but an essential part of important rituals a warning system between the tribes, a means of teaching, and even healing. A drum is humanity's most ancient gadget, so to say. Look at this, Mr. All Smiles. Look at this big, amazing man with a big, happy smile. I'm telling you, every time he smiles, I feel like my mummy gave me a hug. It feels so good and so warm. And now, the dancing starts. Nothing else matters. The audience, it's empty. But that's all of no importance whatsoever. Even if it's a rehearsal, a warm-up, he dances like the biggest performance of his life. And this is truly amazing. I must tell you. These guys are preparing for participation in Zanzibar's major music festival, Zalti Zabusara that takes place every February for 20 years now. Musicians and dancers from the entire continent arrive to the island, and the old town becomes one huge performance space. Just listen to the names of some of the African music genres. Ngoma, Tarab, Kidumba, and Michiriku. The names alone are hard to say, let alone sing those songs. All this makes me feel so amped. It's unbelievable. I feel like I was African in some of my previous lives because I feel it in my blood, surging through me. I feel plugged in and my body begins shaking, my arms moving, my legs moving. So I decided to give it a try and see if skills from my previous African lives might kick in. <laughs> The big guy is like a conductor giving instructions to this drum band. He vocalizes the rhythm and the drummers repeat it. Uh, well, except me. I did okay with a simple rhythm and a bit of dancing, but then the conductor blew his whistle and up to the game, and I got lost.
Pieces of bamboo serve as drumsticks, and the drums are made with cow or goat hide, just like thousands of years ago. The rhythm seems simple, but that's an illusion. These guys work as hard as actors in a music. They sing, dance, and play drums all at the same time. Apart from beaches and caves, the one place you must definitely see here is Stone Town, the old town with its very specific atmosphere. The streets here are so narrow that cars can't go there, they'll just get stuck. The locals drive motorbikes and the tourists walk. The past and the present coexist here, creating a unique, authentic look. Look at this wooden door, for example, all hand carved. It's at least a century old. And right above, you see a cobweb of power lines and surveillance cameras. Look at this man pulling an old cart, like he's an extra in a historical movie. Look at this young lady carrying a box of ice on her head while she's taking a call with her AirPods. The most unusual things I noted among apples, tomatoes, and other veggies at the local market were these weird-looking things that look sort of like a melon or a loaf of bread. This is breadfruit that literally served as bread to the local tribes. It really looks like baked bread, only it grows on trees. One loaf can weigh up to six or even eight pounds. And here is breadfruit again only baked. <laughs> to try local food, I'm waiting for the evening when another market opens, the night food market. They've got tons of kebabs and grilled meat. They've got chicken, rabbit meat, mutton, fresh seafood, squids, lobsters, octopuses, crabs, freshly caught fish that's just been delivered by fishermen. The market is crowded every night. The air is filled with smoke from all the grilling. Everything smells so enticing, all this grilled food. But many young ladies from Europe are here not only to enjoy the grilled lobster, but also to meet local guys. All cooks are beyond reproach, all dressed in white, all very neat and very polite. Absolutely perfect. Each one has his or her own way to attract customers. This one, for instance, is rapping. <laughs> Top 10 radar, yeah, we on your radar. Mm -hmm. Never miss dog. By local standards, the prices here are very high. But for tourists, they are quite manageable. For example, shawarma will cost you two dollars, and three dollars will buy it with fries. This is the first one. This is number one. We have four of them. That's good market. Just look at this guy making shawarma, traditional Arabic rotisserie dish loved all over the world. You can see the meat getting cooked, rotating on a spit. The chef cuts off thin slices and lets them stay a little on the bottom of the tray, and puts the flatbread right there so it can soak up all those flavors and some fat. He adds the sauce. It seems a bit thin and then he picks the whole thing up and makes the traditional wrap. The portion of meat inside is very generous. He doesn't use a lot of veggies. Mm. Mm. Amazing. It's so delicious, an amazing shawarma. No wonder people love it everywhere. Mm. So good, the sauce is so juicy. Mm -mm. Mm. Mm. I love it. I just love it. I say shawarma is the food of gods. It's amazing. So professionally, I'm a teacher, but um, I haven't. I'm not sick for the employment opportunities. You see, I've been employed here for a while to manage this place, which is called Arnold's Chicken Shawarma. 
Uh -huh. So that's what brought me here in Zanzibar. Onesso is 23 years old and he is a very educated guy. He's got two university degrees. He's from a very small village far away on the continent. People do live in a very lampant covert, I can say it like that. So my brother is a little bit older, so he came this way before. Mm -hmm. After seeing such like opportunities, he decided to come, to come and help him to supervise one of the offices. You said to change your life. What was the passion? Why? Was what was the day when you understand? Like I don't sit in this village. I can inspire. It's exactly just no grind. They have cars and such like things. So school that with good houses. Mm. I was also inspired to go for school so that I can own such like things. Uh -huh. Yes. Zanzibar is the place where many Tanzanians go to make some money, especially during the high season. But the truth is that the high season here is all year round, so many just stay. For example, Aneso came here a year ago to help his brother with the expanding business. He's got a new bar and a seafood cafe now. First, Aneso worked for him, but now he's got his own business. He has his three offices here in Zanzibar. So I help him to manage, he pays me at least I get a little bit make life. That's it. <laughs> Good for the pagala oh God, I think eating freshly cooked street food at a market is the best kind of meal ever. It's like waking up in the middle of the night with the munchies. That's what this night food market is about. It's the best shawarma ever. They put just enough sauce, generous but not too much. It's running just a little bit. And it kind of gets in your nerves that it's running. But when you take a bite, it's so heavenly good that you don't care. Mm. Mm. I'm telling you, it's the food of the gods, really. The streets of Stone Town are crowded. Tourists come here not only from Europe, but also from the Middle East. People come here for a beach holiday and to shop. This here is a shop for tourists, for ladies of the Arab world. It sells sequin decorated dresses. The cotton that all these garments are made from is one of the key commodities produced in Tanzania. There is a picture of a cotton bush on Tanzania's coat of arms, here, in this corner. Today, harvesting cotton and cloth making are the process performed by machines, like harvesting machines and looms. But it wasn't always like this. Originally, people harvested cotton manually, then spun a cotton thread and wove threads into cloth, also by hand. And that's where slave labor was in great demand. More than that, the unpaid slave labor was the force that actually made the global industrial revolution happen that started in Britain. Manual cotton production was a highly time and labor consuming process. But then, in 1796, one English weaver invented this device, the spinning jenny. It was the first multi-spindle spinning frame that dramatically reduced the amount of work needed to produce cloth. Just 20 years later, upgraded versions of this machine were able to make cloth 40 times faster than manual workers. Cotton mills were opened in Manchester, and the era of cotton production boom began. All this infrastructure required a lot more raw cotton, and cotton was produced and still hand-picked by slaves on cotton plantations in Africa, India, and America. As demand for cotton grew, more slaves were required. On Zanzibar alone, up to 50,000 slaves were traded annually. While slave and cotton business owners were getting rich, the British Parliament was trying to put an end to this barbaric practice. In 1807, it enacted the first law abolishing slave trade in British colonies, but it didn't work. The profits were too high to give up. The law only made the involved parties invent new ways to keep doing the same. As time went on, nations began banning enslaved labor across the globe. In 1861, Russian Emperor Alexander II abolished serfdom. In 1865, the United States Congress officially abolished slavery. The total number of slaves from East Africa alone traded via Zanzibar between the 7th century and the early 20th century is estimated at 8 million. Since the time that European nations started colonizing America, a total of 120 million African slaves had been shipped there. For comparison, the entire African continent's population in 1820 only counted 74 million people. One important thing in slave trading was finding a place to store slaves. Because you see, if a slave hunting expedition was successful, 
successful, they got many slaves. And then they delivered all those slaves to the market, and that's where they needed a place to keep them for a while. Because they couldn't sell like a thousand slaves all in one day. Because even a busy day at a slave market saw at most 100 slaves change hands. And that's from all the sellers, not just one. So it was imperative for slave traders to have a place to store goods as appalling as that sounds, a place where they could keep them. Zanzibar's slave market got closed too, but illegal slave trading continued even after that for a long time. The business was just too profitable. So slave traders kept kidnapping and selling people, only in secret. Here you can see a very unusual building of sorts. You can see that it's very old indeed. It's at least a hundred years old and it's pretty solid and big. And if you look at it from the outside, you don't even know what to think of it. There's a roof above the grounds and some holes in it. The thing is, the slave traders built this place to keep the slaves and disguised it as a church. They told the locals they were going to build a church for their religion and told them they were not to be disturbed for religious reasons, like it's a taboo. But in fact, there was a very large room underground. That is, local people didn't even know that the moans and cries they heard from inside this place were not the sounds of prayer, but calls for help. Oh my god, they've got these pillars supporting the ceiling here. They are recent, to keep the roof from falling on the heads of some crazy tourists like me. And so they kept the slaves in here. As you can see, the walls here are really high and it's a large space. There's no way you can know how deep this place is from the outside, or that it can contain a lot of people. A real freaking lot of people, I'd say. And so they kept the slaves in this pit, making sure they can't have any contact with the local population and that the place is impossible to get out of. Those were the important things. Slave traders tried to make such hidden places somewhere close to the sea, so they could sneak slaves in and hide them somewhere as quickly and as discreetly as possible. Look at this coastline, perfect white sand, perfect blue sea and palm trees, a perfect setup for your selfie. However, slave traders saw it as a perfect place to do their dirty business. They liked a piece of land that's hard to get to for most people, sea coves and hidden caves that stretched for miles underground. This cave he used for packing slaves for illegally, remember? But he packing here one week or one month. After closed slave market in Danzba, he used this cave for packing mm -hmm. slave. Mm -hmm. Because slave after packing here, he needed to go out. And in the cave with very dark, no light. Another slave needed to go out. Another slave was get injury. Another slave was died. Injured slaves were traded at a discount or finished off on the spot. And the second way, slave after searching the way he needed to go out, he see few light from this side. One slave who going 100 meter, he see full few light from up. Mm. After understanding the way, another slave is get report. Remember, because slave is strong, he fight to go out or to go this way, then to go out. But he need to scramble climbing 90 meter. To go How much? Nine zero. Nine zero. Yes, to scramble climbing wow. to go out. Not possible. Yes, maybe no problem. Maybe you are going this here, riding out other side. Sometimes another animal is falling down in the cave, but no survive because in the cave condition is not good or oxygen is not good. Mm -hmm. And be careful. Another place is slippering and mind your head. Remember slippering. Poly mm. poly. Hakuna matata. It beats me how people could get anywhere in these caves without a light. It's pitch dark, very quiet, and rocks can shift and slide under your foot everywhere you step. I can only hear the dripping of water and noises made by bats. One slave, after searching the way, he need to go out. He see few light from this place. But then he back to telling another slave, I see light from here. But only slave, he going this way to look. After three, he see small opening. But only slave he going this way, he go up. Since many slaves managed to escape from here, slave traders finally stopped using it. The cave hasn't been used ever since and serves today as one of the tourist sites on the island. Now you can come here and literally walk a mile in a slave's shoes. The cave itself is in fact millions of years old, older than slavery itself. It used to be a holy place. People used to come here to pray and collect water. It was believed to have healing powers.
Но так душно, что очень хочется искупаться. It's so hot that I'm really tempted to take a dip. Хладненько. It's fantastic. It's the best thing that happened to me today, that's for sure. It's just so good. I feel like I'm in a luxury spa or something like that. If I just forget for a second that this cave was used to keep slaves, and I'm surrounded by bats and spiders with tentacles, I mean, really, it could really be some special spa offer at a luxury hotel, relaxing in water in a cave. I mean, it would be so worth it. It's an unforgettable experience. Water here is simply perfect. Not too cold, not too warm, and you can stretch and soak. I love taking baths. I spend at least 10% of my life soaking in a bathtub. This is a perfect soak. It's fabulous. It's so good. It's OMG. Today, guys like Inesso have a chance to live and make money, make the Tanzanian dream come true. At least here on Zanzibar, no one is working the locals into the ground on cotton plantations like 200 years ago. Quite on the contrary, Zanzibar is a place where tourists spend money. When I look at these happy, relaxed guys, I cannot help but think, they have survived European colonization, Arabic rule, and slavery got their independence and have built their own paradise on earth. A paradise that is easy to visit. Look at it. My feet are in the sand and I'm trying to bury them deeper and I feel the touch of every grain of this sand massaging me and helping me relax. This is just so incredible. There is this light breeze that is hugging you. It's so sweet and soft like candy cotton and it whispers in your ear, hey friends, this life isn't so bad. All is great. You can play ball, you can go sit or take a boat and go fishing, if you feel like it. You can play volleyball or chill on a sunbed. You can sit or stretch on it and pick up this cocktail and enjoy it. And that's right at this point of time, where you come to the beach in the evening, when it cools down, and as everything around you cools down, you feel yourself cooling down. And all your tension, all the agitation is gone. And you realize, wow, that's how it can be. And I feel some sort of meditative relaxation. And it's particularly amazing here. И прям вот какое-то медитативное вот, я не знаю, расслабление, оно, оно прям здесь очень чувствуется. Я вот здесь... I barely spent 15 minutes at this beach and I already feel all this happening. И все, уже пошел, пошел процесс. Очень совет. I highly recommend you try it. Just stand in the wind and feel this soft, slow and very salty wind blowing right through you as you stand on this white sand, anticipating a cocktail, I say, it's perfect.